So one of the things that um, I teach when I teach, uh, you know, how to, how to manage change is borrowed from Michael Beer at Harvard, and you probably know it. It's the you have to create constructive dissatisfaction, which is in the gay rights movement. I would say that's that's the fighting, that's the legal, that's the we have a right to this. But then you need this vision and the constructive dissatisfaction piece you can do with a small band of true believers. But if you really want to get to that 80% persuadable, which I think is a really great way of looking at it, you need to have a vision that's more encompassing. So if I were to take, take the women's movement as another, another example, um, you know, back in the whatever 60s, we had these women who history has it burned their bras. That wasn't actually their intention, but they were definitely protesting about garments that were considered to be representative of women's oppression and they had this big can and it was like you know put your put your put your things that are going to be oppressed there and somebody very briefly set it alight and that put in motion this whole movement but the trope lived right these bra burning screaming horrible man hating women um and you know my next door neighbor looks at that and goes no way you know i'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole these people are awful but when betty friedan comes along and says equal pay for equal work and here we are in America. I mean, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths to be, you know, a God-given right that we're born equal. Um, now I've got a message that connects, right? Now I've got a message that, well, yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point, right? If you're doing the same job, you should get paid the same. And so I think there's this fascinating progression that you see in some of these movements with the, the, the true believers sort of making this hard case the visionaries reaching out more broadly, and then the process folks, which is the ones I would say you've really honed in on in the book, is, is, is how do we actually, you know, minute by minute, day by day, forge this thing that, that's going to change hearts and minds. It's going to really create new opportunities for something that wasn't possible before. Yeah, I think that's an, this shift from, you know, versus anti you know, moving from the stick to the honey, you know, from the bra burning to the equal pay, equal work. It's a great example. Here's another shift in changing hearts and minds that we observed, which is moving from rational data dumps to emotional connecting with people's reptile brains, right? The, the winning movements no, understand human behavior and human emotions, right? And, and, and let, let's talk about let's talk about smoking now, right? So that issue in our lifetimes, smoking rates in, in America for cigarettes at least are down to 15% nationally for adults, under 6% for youth. Gen Z, teens and tweens could be the generation and smoking for good. I mean, when I grew up, when I was little, and I'm not 10,000 years old, right? You smoked on airplanes. You know, my mother had this whole strategy. Where she would sit, you know, based on what the smoking section was in the airplane. <laughs> Me too. You, you smoked at McDonald's. You smoked at the doctor's office. You, My college professors smoked in their offices. <laughs> <laughs> and I will admit my mom's not on the Zoom. I did it too. There's a lot of other things I regret from the 80s. Gauchos, uh, perms. There's oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> um, but, you know, so you smoke. That's changed. Smoking is not only prohibited, it's infrequent, it's unfashionable, right? It's socially unacceptable in most circles. Now I recognize, you know, go out into um, the heartland, into the Southern states, you have a greater prevalence of smoking, you have higher prevalence in black and um, communities of color, depending on where you are in the country. And, and those rates still need to go down. But overall, the trend you know, is massively, and it saved millions of lives and prevented tens of millions of people suffering from smoking related diseases, right? Um, and how did they do it? Go back to this point about data. We have known since 1964, when the Surgeon General told us that smoking causes cancer, we have had the data. We have known, we have seen anti-smoking messages, right? Um, and yet our behavior didn't shift until this century, right? Why is that? Okay, um, because the, in part, the tobacco control advocates changed laws, slapped excise taxes, built up grassroots movements, built up the non-smokers rights movement. A lot of things was happening at the grassroots like we talked about before across the states. They also were really trying to win over hearts and minds, right? And this becomes important because we go back to this idea of leadership. What kind of leadership, not just styles, but skills do you need? The founding president of Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids 
the uh, central part of the coalition. Um, I will say Caveat Emptor was the, was founded by my uh, teammate and boss at Georgetown, Bill Novelli, who was the founder of a communications um, and PR firm, Porter Novelli. It's now part of Omnicom worldwide. Um, he led that before going on to be the CEO of AARP for many years. He's a big advocate and lobbyist, but he was the founding president of Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids with Matt Myers, who continues to be the executive director of Campaign today. Bill is an admin, a, a, an advertising guy. He was a madman, you know, up on Madison Avenue, watch Mad Men. There's even a spot where they play Bill Novelli in it. And he understood marketing, advertising. The enemy here isn't just Philip Morris and those cigarettes. It's the iconic image of Marlboro Man, of Joe Camel, the, the, the sex appeal, the glamour, the cool factor that you're fighting. You got to fight that first. You can't just tell young people not to smoke. It's bad for them or it makes their breath bad. They don't, you know, that's not going to get to them. You need to present them with something that's as enticing or compelling to counter those very effective images. And we know from data and research, when, when you polled social workers in the 90s um, about uh, that were working with poor children, low income families, Joe Camel had higher name recognition in poor communities in America than Mickey Mouse. 